Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Harlow. I'm the Director of Digital Security at Freedom of the Press Foundation. And we have a lot of really, really excellent programming for you today. So uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of reminders. One, the session is being recorded. And, um, but that said, uh, none of our attendees uh, are visible over video. And actually, uh, I don't believe we can even hear you. And so that said, um, if you do want to ask questions at any point during the programming, um, simply use the Q&A box, which should be on the lower um, right-hand side of you know, the, the menu um, down at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be sure to make sure that those questions get answered. And uh, yeah, without any further ado, I'm going to kick it off to our executive director, Trevor. Thank you, Harlow. And hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Trevor Tim. I'm the executive director of Freedom of the Press Foundation. And we have a really fascinating and timely event for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking about investigative reporting and whistleblowing. And in particular, how our flagship project here at Freedom of the Press Foundation, SecureDrop, is revolutionizing the way that journalists communicate with sources in the digital age. Um, so if any of you are unfamiliar, uh, we actually lead the development of SecureDrop, and we have for over six years now. Um, it was first created by the late internet activist Aaron Schwartz, and essentially SecureDrop is a whistleblower submission system, and it aims to provide a safe way for sources to contact journalists and hopefully avoid many of the types of invasive surveillance that governments have used all over the world to chill reporting and stifle accountability. Um, SecureDrop's now used in over 75 major news outlets worldwide, um, and that includes the New York Times, the Washington Post, ProPublica, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and The Guardian. And so we wanted to host this event to, to give our supporters kind of a closer inside look at both the evolution of SecureDrop, um, but also why we think uh, that our next generation version of the system, which we're actually going to be demoing here for the first time today, is a potential game changer. Um, and so I'm going to say, say a few words uh, about SecureDrop's impact first before we get um, to the demo. And we are really, really excited um, to be joined by uh, Paul Lewis, who is the head of investigations at The Guardian. And uh, in a little bit, he's going to go into detail about how SecureDrop is critical for a lot of The Guardian's incredible reporting on tech companies, on the White House, environmental issues, and, and much, much more. Um, but with the, you know, with so much news of COVID era whistleblowers being punished, the historic protests around the country um, and the election coming up, there's hardly ever been a more important time for investigative journalism. And that's why we are, are super excited that this next generation version of SecureDrop is actually being piloted in a handful of news organizations right now. And we're hoping to roll it out uh, to many, many more um, in the summer and the fall leading up to the election. Um, and so, you know, we often get asked, you know, how many stories originate through a, a, a tip on secure drop or, um, you know, what stories is it responsible for? Um, you know, somewhat frustratingly, you know, there's no way for us to know for sure. Um, and that's because of the way that secure drop is designed. It means that we are essentially, while we build the software and help news organizations install it and train them how to use it, we are actually locked out of the system uh, after it's installed at a news outlet and only they know, and that's for both their protection and for ours. Um, but here's one example that I, I can share with you. Um, so on October 8th, 2016, um, the Washington Post published a, a, a quite shocking story. Um, David Farenhold, who is uh, one of the Post star reporters um, and who actually later would win a Pulitzer Prize uh, for this very story, obtained a secret tape from Access Hollywood. And you actually probably know the next part of this story. Uh, on the tape, a presidential candidate by the name of Donald Trump was actually bragging uh, about sexually assaulting women uh, years earlier. Um, it quickly became the Post's most read story of all time. And it sent reverberations throughout the political establishment. Um, and it was actually the single most important story of the 2016 election, at least at that moment. But here's what a lot of people don't know, was that on the very next day on Twitter, uh, Farenthold was responding to, to some of the, the readers of his story um, when he was asked about safe ways to get in contact with him for more reporting. 
And he said, I quote, the Washington Post's homepage has a secure drop function on the lower right. And he added, end quote, it works, I know. Strongly insinuating that actually he had received uh, this tape um, through the Washington Post secure drop. And Fahrenheit now includes a secure drop link in, in every single note that he sends to potential sources, including uh, many members of the Trump organizations, which he covers almost exclusively now. And so many journalists have similar stories. Um, unfortunately, we'll actually never know those stories because it's important for journalists to protect their sources even after, years after sometimes uh, stories come forward. Um, but uh, it's also why I'm so excited to hear from, from Paul Lewis and The Guardian today because I think they do um, some of the most um, incredible reporting uh, that exists today. Um, and so with that, I'll pass it back over to Harlow and uh, she will host us for the rest of the afternoon. Yep. So Harlow, take it away. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, as Trevor said, uh, we are going to have a hopefully very uh, stimulating discussion with Paul Lewis. Uh, Paul is a, an award-winning journalist, uh, currently the, sorry, uh, I believe, um, the head of investigations after wearing so many hats at this paper and others. Uh, Paul's beats have covered uh, London, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, um, and other places across the globe. And one thing that I'd love to say, um, in addition to thanks for meeting with us today, Paul, is that one of the things that I appreciate so much about your reporting is um, not only the uh, attention that you pay to sources who are working with you on investigations, but also you have a very keen understanding of the tools that are required um, in order to do this modern type of investigative journalism in the public interest. So uh, thank you once again for, for hanging out with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so let's start out by talking about some of your um, investigations. Over the past two years, let's say, do you have any particular investigations that you and your team are, um, are proud of, most proud of? Well, um, I mean, uh, look, The Guardian has got a long, uh, I, I hope quite impressive history of working on some of the biggest investigations around, you know, from uh, Edward Snowden's disclosures over the NSA to WikiLeaks to the, 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 the phone hacking uh, investigation that did so much damage to the Murdoch empire. I've only been head of investigations uh, for a few months now. Um, you mentioned my previous roles. I was seconded to, to San Francisco, to, to Washington. Um, previously uh, to that, I personally worked on lots of investigations about surveillance and undercover policing. I mean, the truth about any form of investigative reporting, regardless of the subject, is you're entirely dependent on sources. And, um, you know, increasingly, Trevor rightly said at the top uh, of his remarks that, that one of the concerns that we have, of course, is protecting our sources' identities from uh, governments uh, who may want to know who they are. I would add to that increasingly corporations too. Um, and the, the, the more difficult and complex and heated an investigation becomes, it's usually the case, the more aware we are of people who are maliciously trying to find out who we're talking to and why. And, and in that context, you know, uh, as sanitized and confidential uh, an encounter you can have with the source, the better, really. So we, we take it really, really seriously. We're very careful with our internal communications. We're very careful with our communications with sources. And in that context, um, secure drop is absolutely indispensable. Um, I mean, it's a regular part of everything. So I'm going on to answer questions you haven't asked. But, but let me just say this, because I, I do feel quite strongly about this. You know, um, Freedom of the Press Foundation do lots of stuff. It's not just secure drop, but, but secure drop is, has become such an integral part of the way we work now on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. Really? And yeah, and, um, and while it is true that we, like other news organizations, cannot say which stories Secure Drop uh, was sort of contributing to, um, there are a lot, and they happen on a quite a frequent basis. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't know how we at The Guardian would be able to do the work we do in a world in which Secure Drop or something like it didn't exist. Um, has any of this uh, impact changed now that, you know, everyone is working from home 
um, teams are now more remotely distributed and sources themselves um, are not going to have, you know, or might not have all the tools that they need in order to establish uh, safe communication? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, um, you know, there's some technical issues to do with the back end of the systems to kill drop, which means we do, you know, we, we, we need some, some sort of in-person presence in the office from time to time, which we've been able to do uh, during the pandemic, which has obviously been helpful. Um, you, you know, I, I, think, I think the pandemic has affected different types of sources in different ways. Um, I mean, <laughs> I'm reluctant to go into too much detail, but, but, but look, one of the advantages of people working from home uh, is that if they are whistleblowers and they have information that is in the public interest that they want the public to know about, they want to contact a journalist, they want to think of creative ways in which they can securely transfer that information to mm -hmm. us. I mean, to, to put it really bluntly, it's quite helpful that they're at home and not in an office surrounded by CCTV cameras and, you know, workstations and computers that are monitored. So I think it has probably created a bit more freedom on the part of sources and whistleblowers. And I also think that we're just in this, and I'd be interested in your thoughts and also, you know, people who are um, involved in this, in this seminar, whether people agree on this. But, 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 but to me, it seems that we're just in this, this moment of global transition. You know, this is a, a massive disruption to the way we live. And, and, in, and the repercussions is just it, it travel in so many different directions, affect so many aspects of how we live. That I think it's just, if you're a journalist in this moment, there's a lot happening. And, you know, we saw a big uptick in the number of submissions we were getting into secure drop um, mm. when the pandemic struck. Um, I mean, three or four times as many as we would normally receive. Um, and, you know, and I think that speaks to the fact that this is a huge global story, but also it's just shaking up so many different aspects of, of life from politics through to economics. And, in all of that, there, there are stories that, you know, someone somewhere doesn't want us to tell, and it's our job to try to find ways to, ways to, to, to tell the story. Um, so when these tips are coming in, how do you, uh, and especially because there's, a, you know, from sheer volume perspective, it might make it a little bit of a challenge um, to go through them. Um, what makes a newsworthy tip? Well, I would say it's often more than just a tip. Um, you know, sometimes it can just be, you know, a piece of information, a lead, a okay. suggestion. Um, but often it's, 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 it's more substantive than that. And sometimes it can be, you know, it can be documents, it can be files, it can be material that itself is the story. Um, now what, what makes something newsworthy is a really uh, complex question. <laughs> it obviously depends entirely on the news organization, everyone and not all journalists, not all news organizations answer that question in the same way. There's a general feeling, I think, among journalists that, that, that newsworthiness is something that is difficult to define, but you sort of know it when you see it. Um, but, but for us at The Guardian, I mean, you know, we're a news organization that uh, has for a long time had a, a, a progressive inclination, I would, I would say. Um, we've tended to be quite anti-establishment if you look at the history of our stories, uh, quite skeptical of, of power and, um, you know, always uh, fair and accurate and faithful to the best kernel of the truth that we can obtain. Um, but, but for us, I think usually, you know, if I think of a sort of quintessentially Guardian story to answer your news, newsworthiness question, it's often a story that punches upwards. It's often a story about power about wrongdoing of some kind, about injustice. Um, and, and I guess if you, know, if, that, if, you want to, if the question rephrased is, is what makes our journalists sort of passionate about their subject, it tends to be something like that. Cool. That's very, very well, well put, I think. Um, so uh, aside from Secure Job, because we're going to be talking so much about Secure Job, I'm very curious to know more about what other tools you have in you know, your, your your war chest, let's say, uh, in order to maintain this type of confidentiality, yet keeping everybody effective and connected. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you, you'll hear this from many journalists. Um, you know, Signal, which is end-to-end -end encrypted, is a, is a tool that is often used to converse with sources. Um, uh, we would generally, for 
you know, confidential discussions want to avoid WhatsApp, um, uh, which has been compromised. Um, uh, Proton Mail is 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 a is another end-to-end -end encrypted email server that is uh, sometimes used by journalists. I mean, we we tend to use all sorts of different communication methods, often depending on the source. And I think, you know, one of the things that you learn as a reporter uh, is that you, you know, you, you sometimes need to take your lead from the whistleblowers and what they're comfortable with, um, because different people have got different uh, sort of pressures. Uh, different considerations, different personal practices for how they communicate. And, um, and I sometimes think it's good while always practicing the highest level of security you can to meet the source on their level so that they are comfortable. Because one of the important things when you're talking to people about giving you information is making sure that, that they feel comfortable and confident about the conversation they're having with you. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's any you know, set answer to that. I mean, the other thing I would say is in it, in an era of increasing digital surveillance, sometimes there are occasions when the best method of communication is an in-person one in which neither party takes their phone to a meeting. Um, that sounds very old fashioned, <laughs> uh, but it does happen. Um, uh, but, but, you know, just to go back to secure drop a second of all of the things that I just mentioned, you know, I don't think there is another more secure method of transferring a file from a whistleblower to uh, a journalistic organization currently than SecureDrop. And uh, I remember many, I say many years, about 10 years ago, eight, eight, nine, 10 years ago, before the Snowden story, having a conversation with The Guardian's former editor, Alan Rusperger and some other technical colleagues about, about whether we could create what we were then calling a sort of, you know, a digital mailbox that people yeah. could use to send us information and not leave a trace that could identify them. And we put some thoughts into this and uh, we came up with the conclusion that we just didn't have the technical know-how. And it was, it was a couple of years after that that, that um, SecureDrop was launched and we, we adopted it soon after. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, you, you've been with the SecureDrop project for a while now. So um, I'm sure, you know, uh, your newsroom is incredibly adept uh, at using it. But that said, uh, you know, there are certain types of pain points. As you mentioned, this is, um, it sets a very, very high bar from a technical perspective. And so that often does mean that there are pain points or maybe friction in using it effectively. Uh, do you, does your newsroom uh, or does your team ever experience any particular pain points? Um, Look, I think, I think it's a trade-off, right? And, you know, if you want to engage out of respect to your source's confidentiality in the utmost, you know, most, most secure form of, um, of communicating, uh, then that will necessarily mean that you're going to have to adopt an approach which is more time-consuming. And that is the case for us going through SecureDrop, um, you know, people on this call who are familiar with it will, 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 will know the requirements around air gap computers and the like. And, um, and it takes a while. Um, and we, we, you know, we, we go through the information and check it pretty much on a daily basis. Um, unfortunately, there are, not, there are no shortcuts, but um, I think the trade-off is well worth it because, you know, um, I do sit in a privileged position. I, I, I receive that information every day. I, you know, sometimes, um, disseminate that information to reporters and journalists around the newsroom uh, who, can, who can push the investigation forward or maybe turn something into a story. So, so from my vantage point, I see the stories that emanate from this portal. Um, and for that reason, I think there's, you know, there's, there's, I wouldn't hesitate in saying that the trade-off is, is, is worthwhile. The pinch point, as you put it euphemistically, I would describe it as, you know, it, it can be a little bit time consuming and the workflow, I know you have a workstation demo um, on this uh, Hangout. Um, and that side of things can take a bit, take, that sort of user interface can take a bit, bit longer. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that that's something that, that you guys hope to smooth out in the years ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, by the way, anyone in the audience, if you want to uh, ask Paul uh, or maybe some of his colleagues some questions, feel free to use our Q&A um, box. Um, in the meanwhile though, uh, another question that we um, 
often uh, in digital security trainings, often consult other journalists and other newsrooms on our, um, you know, how to enrich the, the feature set that we currently um, support. So SecureDrop, um, it's, as its name would suggest, it focuses a lot on the actual um, connection and communication between uh, newsroom and, and sources. Uh, but the stories never stop there. And uh, historically, or at least from my perspective, when we are training news orgs on how to use SecureDrop, uh, we pretty much can only get them to the point that they've um, received a submission and then we just kind of have to leave them. But we want to change that from so many perspectives. Uh, does, uh, have you ever had any conversations about, um, you know, uh, other features that we could incorporate to help you out a little bit more as stories develop? Yeah, I, I think, I think um, it's a really, I mean, it's a great question. I have to say, um, it's really impressive from, from my perspective as well that you guys are thinking about ways to improve, improve Secure Drop. You know, I mean, it's a great sign that, 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 that you want to make it better because it, it works great as, as things stand. Um, I, I would say that one of the things that, see some of the challenges, I'm not sure whether there is a technical solution to. Um, so, you, you know, necessarily because you have the process that you, the protocols that you have in place, to maximize security and anonymity. Um, you, you don't want a situation where you're, for example, you know, alerting a whistleblower or source, mm -hmm. sending them a message on their phone, for example, to give you a, a, clung, a clunky example to make the point, saying, you know, your secure drop has been uh, received and is now being reviewed. Um, because obviously, you know, so, suddenly that there's gonna be a trace. So um, some of the things that we would in theory like to see, um, I can understand why it would be hard to implement. You know, a more regular method and easy to use method to sort of communicate with sources is always helpful. I mean, sometimes we have to take conversations away from Secure Drop and we take them to other places. Um, and often, you know, I, I would put a, an onus on conversation because one thing that can be very difficult in our profession is when someone just, um, you know, sort of drops something and then uh, vanishes and you never hear from them again. Um, and often the process of verification uh, and finding out more if we can about the nature of the submission and why the person's got in contact, you know, answering questions that we'll inevitably ha have, all of that is reliant on an ongoing dialogue if we can get it. So, so our preference would, would always be, I think, to be able to have an ongoing dialogue, which is as frictionless as possible with a source. But, but we recognize that, that from a technical perspective, if you have a system that, um, that prioritizes anonymity and confidentiality and security, then that's not always going to be as, as frictionless as we might want it. Fascinating. Um, I guess another question that, uh, that I have has to do with uh, the role of, let's say, metadata. So meaning when you receive a submission, um, you know, printing of the original version of it could lead to potentially disaster um, if you're still leaving like bits of information embedded that we aren't really trained to see inside the document. Um, yeah. What uh, do you have any like tips for, um, you know, um, possibly cleaning those things up and what works best for you? Yeah, well, so I, I say a couple of things. I mean, one of them is um, I, I'm very lucky that I have um, some very technically skilled colleagues who are much better at searching for metadata in documents and files than I am, and much better at cleaning that in the event that we would ever want to make anything public. So I'm not one of those people myself. Um, so I'm not sure I would give you a technical answer to the question. I would say that, that generally speaking, we, it, just in the same way that we don't say when a story is emanated from some a submission via secure drop, that it came via secure drop. We also generally tend, you know, not to publish uh, documents or files that have been submitted to us without really thinking through whether that's necessary and, and, and without being completely sure that we don't think that's gonna compromise a source. So we've, we, whenever we do that, we're really careful about it. Mm -hmm. Those are, um... Uh, decisions that you can't be capricious about making. So uh, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
I really, really appreciate having the opportunity to talk to you. Um, and we admire your work so much. And um, thank you for your vote of confidence. And Freedom of the Press Foundation is working very, very hard to continue to support uh, you, your team, and journalists who are doing this amazing work. So thank you so much, Paul. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, also, Paul is going to be around with us. So if you do uh, think of a question um, or are inspired to ask something uh, based off of other things that you've seen during our demo and, and other parts of the presentation, feel free to use that Q&A box. Um, but in the meanwhile, I think it's kind of uh, the perfect time to uh, introduce Mikhail, Connor, and Ro, um, who are going to be showing you the demo of the new Secure Drop workstation. Hello everyone, thanks Harlow. Uh, my name is Mikhail and I'm the lead developer of SecureDrop. Um, as Trevor discussed earlier, we at Freedom of the Press Foundation maintain the SecureDrop project. We develop and distribute the software, um, but we also write the documentation, provide trainings to journalists and also technical support to news organizations. So once SecureDrop is installed in a news organization, they fully own and operate their instance uh, and we or any other third party don't have access to the system. And this is by design. SecureDrop makes it easy for whistleblowers to submit files or messages, but as Paul alluded to earlier, uh, it can sometimes be a little bit time consuming for journalists to check for new submissions. So each time a journalist wants to view a file that was submitted by a source, they'll first need to download it from an internet connected computer, shuttle it to a dedicated offline computer, also known as an air gap, uh, to then finally view the submission on this uh, air gap computer. Once they viewed the submission, the journalist will then need to return to the internet connected computer should they want to reply to a source. So despite all this complexity, these steps are necessary to protect journalists and source materials. For a news organization receiving anonymous submission, sometimes the concern is not only third parties, um, but also hackers and state sponsored attackers. Uh, and Paul mentioned earlier, perhaps even uh, large corporations. This unfortunately can make it a little bit cumbersome to use. So for example, if a news organization gets 100 submissions per day, it could be conceivably someone's full-time job uh, to check secure drop and respond to sources. So we've spent uh, the past two years reworking this journalist experience uh, by recreating this air gap I alluded to earlier into a virtual setting to find a way to safely automate some of these repetitive tasks and to make it much quicker for journalists to check for messages and for them to be able to safely view these submissions that were anonymously submitted. So we are very proud to say that today, the Secure Drop workstation is being used by journalists as part of a pilot with three major news organizations. Um, this workstation allows journalists to easily exchange messages with sources, but also safely open attachments and this all on the same computer. This is one way we can help with this security convenience balance trade-off that was brought earlier. Um, the workstation also provides building blocks so that we can integrate more tooling and streamline some journalistic processes. Uh, and we are also incorporating uh, user feedback from the pilot participants. I'd now like to hand it over to my colleagues, Connor and Roe, who will show you how the Secure Drop workstation is used in newsrooms today. Thanks so much, Mikhail. Uh, my name's Connor. I'm Chief Technology Officer here at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, I think both Mikhail and Paul have given us a great intro here to uh, how Secure Drop is currently working and where we hope to go with it. Uh, so in the next portion here, uh, my colleague Ro and I are going to give you a live demonstration of the next generation workstation. And Ro is going to play the role of a source. So Ro, Ro will role play uh, someone contacting a fictional news organization and sending in some information. And I will play the role of a journalist operating this next gen secure drop. So as we step through this role, um, I really want to focus on some of the efficiency notes that uh, Paul very rightly brought up. The existing secure drop solution that we currently maintain, the one that's used in 75 newsrooms around the world, is a little bit cumbersome, to put it lightly. So here, I'm sharing here a, a, just a photograph of what uh, a, good, a significant portion of the secure drop installation looks like. Mikhail mentioned that there's one computer that's, that's internet connected, that's here on the left, uh, and then there's an air gap offline computer that's on the right. And so a journalist will download the encrypted submission on the computer on the left, and then transfer it via USB stick over to the other one to actually see what was sent. And then if they want to write back, they have to switch back to the other machine. So that ferrying back and forth is something that we're really working hard to streamline while we still want to maintain the same security controls that's absolutely uh, critical in this project in particular. And the workstation has allowed us to do that in a very efficient but still safe way. So with that, um, I'll pass it over to Ro, uh, who will show you what it's like for a source uh, to experience SecureDrop. 
Thank you so much, Connor, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rowan. I'm the Newsroom Services Coordinator at Freedom of the Press Foundation. I work with the SecureDoc team and the Digital Security team. Um, but today I'm going to take off that hat for a moment and step you through a whistleblower experience of what it's like to submit to SecureDrop. Um, so I'm going to share my screen momentarily and I will be stepping into the role of Seymour Source. So Seymour Source is a um, fictitious procure procurement officer with a New England law enforcement agency. So I, Seymour, notice over the course of my work that there are a number of interagency procurement requests for uh, surveillance technology that are being made. And I come to understand that this surveillance technology is actually being requisitioned to surveil local citizens who are participating in peaceful demonstrations. So I decide that the truth has to get out. So as Seymour, I'm also a reader of the fictitious magazine, The New York World, and I know them to produce quality investigative journalism. So I visit SecureDrop, which I'm aware of, and I look at the SecureDrop directory um, to try to find a list of all the available, um, you know, recommended SecureDrops that I can contact. And as I'm looking through this directory, I happen to notice that one of the available instances is in fact the New York world. This gives me a lot of confidence that I can reach the New York world securely. Um, and I also happen to notice them tweeting about SecureDrop on their social media. So from these steps, I feel fairly confident in reaching out to them. I gather some digital evidence and I find a private location with my own computer and an internet connection that I control and feel safe on that is not my employer's computer and not my employer's internet connection. Um, I have no interruptions and I prepare to use SecureDrop. So from this directory, I have received um, a URL, which is a special URL, looks like this one that you see here. Um, and I fire up something called Tor Browser in order to um, visit this URL. Now, why am I in Tor Browser and what's that all about? Essentially, um, this URL is only usable in Tor Browser and um, Tor allows me to route my internet traffic through various computers all over the world and encrypt that traffic so that um, the requests are, are anonymous and secure and so that my identity cannot be determined by, for example, my IP address, which would be tied to my location. So, Using Tor browser under the hood, kind of unbeknownst to me, there's lots of security and anonymity built in. I am able to visit this website and this is what it looks like to me as a source for the first time coming to SecureDrop. I see I'm at the New York World SecureDrop and I decide to get started. You'll notice there is a slight bit of latency as my travel is routed through the Tor network. So this demo is in fact happening in real time. Here I am at the initial screen. I'm presented with a passphrase, which I can use in the future to log back into SecureDrop um, and check if the journalists have responded to me. But for now, since this is my first time, I'm going to go right ahead and submit documents. And now I get to think about what I want to say to the New York world. Hey, New York world, the truth has to get out. I have more evidence and I decide to attach one of those files. I go ahead and click Submit. And my response has been encrypted, sent to the server via the Tor network, and I see the success message. So at this point, I'm fairly confident that I made a submission to the New York world, and all I have to do is wait to hear back from them. I'll kick it over to Connor to explain the experience from a journalist perspective. Thanks so much, Ro. So again, this demo that we're providing to y'all is live and in real time. So that means both Rose traffic and my own to connect are going over the Tor network and connecting to a secure drop test server that we have running on hardware. So we're giving you this demo in real time. And after having submitted that, that whole source process that Ro ran through uh, is not changing in this next generation of the architecture. That's already been proven to work quite well and been a pretty efficient, uh, low friction workflow for sources to use and the next generation secure job architecture is focusing on making it similarly streamlined for journalists. Because we've gotten a lot of feedback that it takes a lot of time to develop these back and forth conversations with sources. So I will go back to sharing my screen. And this is the login screen that one sees uh, on firing up the workstation. So rather than those two separate computers that I was showing you before, this is one integrated laptop this is what the login screen looks like when accessing SecureDrop. Uh, journalists who are currently using it already have a username and password that will work fine on this system. Uh, we're, we're building this on top of the existing infrastructure. So 
now I will take you to the actual interface that I have running on a separate machine. Um, I have this plugged in as an external monitor here. So on the left hand side, you can see a list of different sources that I've been corresponding with. And on the right hand side, it's the actual text back and forth uh, for a given source. So this is a familiar chat like interface, uh, not unlike an interface uh, that might be familiar from Signal Desktop or even something like Slack. Uh, the, the, the crucial aspect here is that all communication back and forth messages and even file submissions are routed through Tor and through the secure drop servers. So everything is uh, metadata res resistant. We're not logging any of that source behavior. So you can also see timestamps here on the left hand side because Roe just submitted something today, something new. That's going to be the newest one I have at the top, 12th of August today. So this coarse grained chase. This is a, uh, a handle that was automatically generated by the secure drop system so that journalists have a way to refer to this given source. Here's the message that Ro just typed for us. Hey, New York World Truth has to get out. I have more evidence. So that's the text that she put, but she also uploaded a file. I have a download button here. By clicking this, my laptop is going out and requesting that encrypted file from the secure drop server that we're running on hardware. I can see that the file was called agency report surveillance.jpg. Looks like an image. I'll click on that and open it up. This is, to get even this far in the current architecture, a journalist would have to download the encrypted message and file and then move that over to a separate computer. So I've already been able to read the text because it was decrypted on the fly in this, in this secure application that we have. And now when I opened it up, it created an isolated environment on this same laptop so that I can safely view this submission. We worked really hard to make sure that we could have the same security controls of, as a separate computer while combining it onto a single workstation. The way this works, I'm happy to go into more technical detail at the end during Q&A. In a nutshell, we're leveraging uh, hypervisor isolation. This is similar to what a cloud provider uses. For example, Amazon, when they rent out servers for $5 a month for one website, and then a second customer comes along and wants to host a different website, Amazon needs to safely isolate those two websites and those two customers' information from each other. The Cube's operating system that we've built the workstation on top is leveraging that same uh, hypervisor isolation technology. So now that I've viewed this submission, I've already saved probably about 20 minutes in, in the back and forth. I can view this side by side with the conversation I'm having with the source and having actually seen what was in this content, I can immediately write back to the source and say, interesting, please, please send along more info if you have it, documents as well. And then I will click on the send button and that message goes immediately back over to the source. So what we're trying to focus on here is uh, reduce that back and forth cumbersome workflow and just focus on the discussion so that reporters can focus on, I'm an investigative journalist, I want to build rapport with the source and ask my clarifying questions. And we've achieved this in pretty much near real time. So I'll pass briefly back to Rose so that she can demonstrate what the source sees on their side. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, so again, back to the source experience. Um, you can see that I know I, I, I sent my message successfully, but now I'm waiting to receive a message. Um, I have a couple of different options. Um, I can log back out, exit my session, you know, and come back at a later time that I feel safe. Or I can sit here as some sources do and just refresh this page and hope and hope to get a reply. So I'm refreshing the page and it turns out that right below here, I can see that I have a reply. It's so beneficial to me as a source that this is able to happen in a much closer to real time schedule. Um, it allows the conversation to flow. It allows me to be responsive to the journalist's needs, which is incredibly important in a tight timeline. So please send along more info if you have it. I will say yes, absolutely. Um, and I will send some more evidence. Just waiting for it to send and now I can see that it was sent. So I am able to, I'm going to log out for now. That's enough that I'm doing as a source this time. Um, and I will actually pass it now over to Harlow. All right. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's been a lot of excellent work going into this, uh, into this project now and it's at, like, it blows my mind away every time I, I see a demo. Um, it's gone so far. Uh, so, well, let's talk about like the process, um, Ro, Connor, Mikhail, of getting to this point. I know that your team has been working incredibly, um, incredibly hard here. So, um, what, um, what has that process been like uh, in designing this new workflow? 
Sure, I could I could start with with responding, and maybe Connor, you can uh, chime in afterwards. Um, we we had the idea of of de developing um, based on this cubes operating system for a while now. Um, as part of the development in the early days of development, one thing that that we that we uh, did as part of the design work was to um, enumerate and describe all the potential threats um, that a system like this would. Um, would have. So uh, during the design phase, really deeply analyzing um, some of the security considerations of building a tool like this. Based on uh, this analysis, uh, we've, we've architected uh, the, the uh, different virtual machines inside the system um, and various components of the system based, based on this analysis. Um, and then uh, about a year ago, um, undergone a, a security audit by a third-party company just to validate some of the assumptions and to ensure that some of our um, security analysis was um, to, to, to validate some of our assumptions on the security analysis. Yeah. Connor, would you have anything else to add to that? Sure. Quickly, I'll just tack on. Um, yes, we're, we're very pleased with the architecture as it's coming together. Um, the classic security model has, has been audited several times by external parties, and we even have completed an audit of this next generation workstation as well. The report came back glowing. Uh, we, have, we have that published on our, on our secure.org website as well. And one thing that we're coming to see as we get this into newsrooms uh, in the pilot program, so a very limited subset of secure drop users are, are currently testing the workstation. And what we're seeing right away is the, the, the feedback has been uh, resoundingly positive in terms of, hey, I'm saving a lot of time here. Like I really get to focus on what I do. Mm -hmm. And one piece of feedback that keeps coming up is uh, as folks shift to working from home more, um, th that's really important the design process. We're interviewing folks and saying, hey, how is this working? How is this developing? We pressed forward with the pilot, even though everybody was switching to a work from home model earlier this year. And it turns out that was um, a, a really fortunate coincidence uh, for all involved. Uh, one thing we're hearing from journalists is, hey, I used to have to bookmark like half a day. It was like pretty much a full time job for somebody to be checking secure drop when there were multiple ongoing investigations. And now, as part of this work from home environment, someone is able to have a dedicated computer. They no longer need to go into a secure office and access a secure room, check out some hardware under lock and key. They can instead use this dedicated laptop and they can boot it up in the morning. And we've had folks report to us, hey, I now check secure drop over my morning coffee as I'm going about checking with my other colleagues. So that's great feedback so far. And we're very much hoping to extend the platform from there. That's awesome. Um, you've been mentioning a couple of terms that uh, sometimes I get a little bit confused by. Um, so I, I know that we are using this new operating system called Cubes, and it works with virtual machines. Um, is it going to be, uh, do you anticipate that it'll be uh, hard for people to, to adapt to this new operating system? Great question, Harlow. It's always a concern uh, that we have when balancing, you know, do, do we invest more in, in training and education or, or, or do we say, hey, we'll build something custom here and then show folks how to use that. It's always a balance we need to strike. Uh, we're, we're in a pretty good position with this next generation of SecureDrop because historically anyone already using SecureDrop is already using a custom operating system. Uh, I think currently that's Tails. So for both the secure viewing station and the journalist workstation in the current architecture, uh, journalists are live booting into a USB key on dedicated hardware and then navigating this Linux interface. So the, what we've been able to do with the next gen workstation based on cubes is actually have a more holistic, cohesive experience that operates a lot more like a traditional desktop computer um, that people would expect to interact with. And the fact that they no longer need to ferry encrypted files around and manually decrypt them over USB keys on an offline computer has really simplified the workflow. That's something yeah. that's come up pretty consistently in our feedback. Yeah. Um, in using SecureDrop, uh, you're definitely introduced to a lot of um, terms and concepts like keys and, you know, air gapping and all that stuff. And it does absolutely seem that you've made these things as transparent as possible to the user in a very effective way. Um, but none of these things have gone away. Am I correct? That's right. Uh, it, was, it was critical to us in order, while, while we certainly have always want, long wanted to make this a more efficient process, we were not willing to sacrifice the security controls that has made SecureDrop successful and so valued. Uh, sources have learned to trust SecureDrop because if the newsroom implements it uh, safely, it's, it's going to be a reliable method to retain their anonymity and to communicate uh, securely. So even pulling in uh, a major architectural change like the Cube's workstation, we wanted to make sure that we had those same security guarantees. And we're very impressed with that. And uh, so far, the external audits we've had to date 
uh, very much validate the approach that we're taking, where the secure, isolated environments that we have for viewing submissions uh, sufficiently separates everything from a security perspective, so that even the GPG key and the application uh, that I showed on the screen that actually has source messages, as well as documents being opened, all of those are happening in separate environments that is uh, a rather uh, comparable analog to the separate machines that we had. The, the great feature about the Cube's workstation is now we can have multiple of those environments, right? We were restricted before to having one isolated offline machine. Now we can open up multiple documents from multiple sources safely and continue the discussion in near real time. Yeah, that's um, a really, really excellent point. One of the things about SecureDrop was that, you know, there was just pretty much one employee who had access to this air gap and it was really cumbersome to, you know, have several different air gaps that you can safely um, uh, distribute amongst staffers. And now you can actually open up the process to multiple staffers, and that's going to make everyone a lot more efficient. Um, yeah, so here's a question. Uh, can Secure Drop or maybe even Cubes or anything like that work as an alternative for um, uh, currency or even accounting that can be hidden from uh, a fiscal perspective? To like unlink from bureaucracy, and I guess my follow-up question would be like, can I put Bitcoin on it? I see. I I, I believe I appreciate the question. Um, please, who, who's asking that? Feel free to rephrase uh, if this answer doesn't address it. Um, what what I hear in that question is uh, some mention of uh, the so SecureDrop is using the Tor network. Um, and that's basically the, the platform that allows for anonymity at the network layer. Because um, if you just, if one navigates to NewYorkTimes.com, that's left a metadata trail for your internet traffic, right? You check that from your office, you check that from your home network. Um, not only does New York Times know where you were when you access them and could maybe later be compelled to divulge that information, uh, but other people on the network, primarily nation states or other attackers, would be able to view that. So we use Tor to make sure that that traffic is routed randomly around the world and near impossible to reconstruct who said what when. That's the value of Tor. So Tor is one piece of technology that we're pulling in here that's already well vetted and well reviewed that we can then extend for a specific purpose, that being secure uh, journalist source communications in this case. Um, in, in terms of currency, SecureDrop has no role in that directly. We're leveraging Tor to communicate the, uh, the, the traffic in between it and the, the, the SecureDrop servers are dynamically encrypting anything that they get. That, that's how we were able to leverage this air gap, this separation of the encryption key material, because every time the server receives anything, it immediately encrypts it to a public key, and that private key is stored separately. That means that even if a government were to break down the door of the New York Times or the Washington Post and say, give us your secure drop servers, well, there's not really any information on there for them to get off because it's all encrypted. We, we've designed that intentionally that way that led to uh, contributed to some of the cumbersomeness of the architecture. And that's what we're trying to address here with this new workstation. So I, I hope that addresses your question about uh, any potential application for uh, currency. We're not leveraging those specific technologies here, um, but uh, I'm happy to expand on that comment if you need to raise. Um, well, I mean, that does beg the question, uh, what other tools might um, you uh, outfit the secure drop workstation with? Um, it may not be Bitcoin, but it could be. Um, but maybe it could be uh, other tools that uh, journalists use to communicate over um, other methods. So uh, Paul mentioned Signal, for instance. What's the possibility of doing something like that? Uh, we're very interested in exploring that. Um, early on in the pilot, we're getting a lot of feedback where uh, folks do have a need to use Signal. I mean, there are a couple of applications for that in the newsroom, as you well know, Harlow. Um, internally, uh, like an investigative team, um, frequently geographically distributed these days, uh, will need a way to discuss what they're working on, and that needs to be end-to-end -end encrypted. So one common need we're seeing is that folks will be interacting with uh, secure drop, or communicating back and forth with the source, but then have a few other colleagues who may not have direct access uh, to the secure drop system. And so those folks will use a, uh, a signal group with disappearing messages. And so only their investigative colleagues are on that group and the small bit of metadata that's leaked to a passive observer is basically, hey, a bunch of journalists at The Guardian are talking to a bunch of other journalists at The Guardian, right? That's, that's fine. And they can leverage that tool to discuss the source, recommend other questions, even share documents. So that export workflow is something that we're very interested in hammering out. Um, there's also been a longstanding ask for, it came up earlier in today's discussion, uh, metadata redaction. Um, there, there are common workflows that one can apply. One of the problems we've experienced with the current secure drop architecture and its air gap is that while very secure and isolated, 
it is quite difficult for us as developers and maintainers of the project to ship updates and even feature sets that uh, improve on what's possible with SecureDrop to that offline computer. So a great benefit to the workstation is now that we can have unattended upgrades and ship more features over time based on feedback from other journalists, we can now expand the tool set. Ideally, we'd have a redaction workflow so that on the same workstation, one can redact metadata in an image such as GPS coordinates. This has been used to burden sources in the past um, or, or even more simple document redaction in order to safely export something to a colleague. So if we can do that sanitization integrated in the workflow, right now what we do, uh, Harlow's team actually trains people on these workflows and a bunch of uh, custom um, so software projects and, expl and explains how to do it manually. It's great to upskill journalists in that regard, um, but we very much like to do the hard work for them so they can focus on the investigative reporting. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so finally, let's take one more question. Um, actually, this is for Paul. Uh, what, what do you think? This is your first time seeing this, uh, and do you have any uh, initial uh, uh, impressions? Um, yeah, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it looks amazing. I, uh, funnily enough, well, I had two thoughts. One is that I hope people watching this don't think our whole conversation was overly choreographed. I had no idea that you were about to introduce a workstation that would really? enable this kind of uh, conversation flow between sources and journalists. I mean, it, it, um, it will make things a lot more, um, a lot less time uh, consuming, for sure less cumbersome, less friction. So, um, I mean, I, it, one way of thinking about what we do is, um, is we've only got a finite amount of time, obviously, and we have to decide what we want to spend our resources, our time on. And, and the great luxury that investigative journalists have as opposed to other types of reporters is they get more time. Um, but, but, but the work is, the, the, you know, the work outside of the source cultivation um, can be very um, complex, uh, time-consuming, laborious, frustrating. <laughs> so, so actually, the, the more time we get, as sort of Connor suggested, the more time we get to focus on that side of things, the better. And and a system like this could 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 really mean that because it is right to say that um, that you know doing a, a, a decent job of checking secure drop every day and communicating with sources. If you're a major new news organization like the Guardian, New York Times, the Post, you'll get lots of submissions. So, so doing that justice just takes a long time. We have, um, it's not just me who does it, the Guardian. This, you know, we have a, a, a team um, and they are sort of t technically minded editorial team. Um, but they work with me and there are sort of six people who we sort of share the burden of, 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 do, of going through it all. And this will make a, a very significant difference. And actually, as we, I was watching this presentation, I was, I was chatting with my colleague who runs that team, Luke Coyland. And I can tell you on his behalf, he was very excited too. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Great to hear. Yeah. Um, thank you. Cool. Thank you everyone for this conversation. And uh, right before we wrap today, um, I'm going to kick it over to our Director of Development, Louise. Hi, Harlow. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm great. Great. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. I, I, as Harlow mentioned, I'm Louise Balsmeyer. I'm the Director of Development at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, a big thanks to my brilliant colleagues for outlining the next generation of SecureDrop. We are so excited to get uh, moving on this. And thank you so much to all the attendees today for taking the time to listen in and learn more about our work. I did want to take a minute to note the financial aspect of the Secure Drop project. Um, obviously, a lot of money has gone into developing the, the next generation. Um, so it takes just over uh, $1.2 million to maintain and develop Secure Drop every year, which is about a third of our annual budget. Um, we do receive a small amount of revenue from news organizations who use it, but not, it doesn't come even close to covering uh, the total of all of its expenses, which is why SecureDrop is mostly funded by the generosity of individuals and foundations. Um, particularly during this time, as everyone mentioned today, many news outlets have been forced to work from home during this public health crisis, 
And it's meant that they have not been able to access their secure drop. Um, and many others have not been able to check it with the frequency that they used to. Yet investigative reporting is needed more than ever now. Um, and reporters desperately need secure drops. Um, and many newsrooms are reaching out to us, urgently asking us for help to figure out what to do, both during this crisis and beyond. And so this next generation of secure drop, which we demoed for you today, really is the answer to this problem. But in order to get it in the hands of as many newsrooms as possible, we are in need of funding to accelerate its testing, development, and deployment to help as many journalists as we can, and in turn help society get the information that we all desperately need right now. So supporting SecureDrop is really the very best thing you can do right now to help journalists in this country. And I just want to thank all of our current and longtime donors uh, who have supported this program thus far. Um, it's really meant the world to us. Um, if any of you today would like to make a gift to help the Secure Drop project, uh, we would ask that you please reach out to either me or Trevor Kim, our executive director. Um, you can also go to freedom.press slash donate if you'd like to donate online to support us. Um, and with that, I think uh, I'm wrapping it up today. So thank you all. Please stay safe out there. And, uh, and thank you for joining us today.